Doctor Who has one of the most passionate and enduring fan bases in the world. Like the Master and the Daleks, this fandom just never seems to die. And with the excitement surrounding Russell T Davies' return in 2023, it only looks set to grow. But like any other fandom, Whovians do have those issues that they just can't seem to agree on. Now, the vast majority of Doctor Who storylines are well liked and don't really cause much of a stir amongst fans, but there are certain episodes or even certain scenes, characters or storylines that aren't quite so lucky. So with that in mind then, I'm Ellie with Who Culture, here with 10 Doctor Who controversies that divide fans. Number 10. Was the end of time a satisfying send-off for the 10th Doctor? With David Tennant dominating the news cycle as of late, now seems like the perfect time to revisit a topic that has seen much debate in the years since he left the show. Was his final story, The End of Time, actually any good? Or was it a total hot mess that didn't give arguably the best Doctor of all time the send-off he deserved? You'll often find people saying that the end of time has a bunch of terrific moments peppered throughout, like the Four Knocks, the Rassilon confrontation and the Doctor's Time Lords Live Too Long speech, but that the master plotline is far too silly, the Doctor's farewell tour is self-indulgent and drags on way too long, and that sub-villain Joshua Naismith is a complete waste of screen time. Elsewhere, some find that the Tenth Doctor's final line, I don't want to go, veers heavily into cringe territory, while for others it instantly triggers the waterworks. In general, it's the story's emotional beats that people praise the most, from the Doctor's realisation that Wilf is trapped in the radiation booth, to Geoffrey Noble lending the Doctor some money for a lottery ticket. Thanks to Bernard Cribbins and David Tennant's incredible performances, there's a massive beating heart, or hearts, at the centre of the end of time that does paper over some of the cracks. But coming off the Waters of Mars thrilling complex storyline, it's hard not to wish that Ten's conclusion was a bit more engaging in the narrative department. Now, for me personally, I think I have to agree that the storyline element of that episode wasn't the strongest. It's not a storyline that sticks in my mind that I can always remember. But I do think that the emotion was definitely there and I don't think I have a problem with the farewell tour as it's put here because particularly for the fourth series and for David Tennant's Doctor, those companions are such an important part of the storylines that we've seen. So I almost feel like it wouldn't have been right for him to have not said goodbye to them. I do think that there is one character in that lineup of farewells that just wasn't quite right, it seemed a little out of place, which was the great granddaughter of Joan Redfern. Number 9. Could the Fifth Doctor have saved Adric? Although Adric is usually at the bottom of the pile when it comes to ranking the companions, his death in 1982's Earthshock was one of the most, well, shocking moments in the show. So much so that the end credits rolled in complete and utter silence for the first time in Doctor Who history. But rather unexpectedly, Adric found himself back in the news when Series 12 was on the air in early 2020, with fans debating whether or not his death could have actually been prevented by the Fifth Doctor. This debate was sparked by the episode Praxius, where the 13th Doctor uses her TARDIS to rescue Jake Willis, who has decided to manually pilot a small spaceship after its autopilot fails. Right before this spaceship explodes, the TARDIS captures Jake like a net, shielding him from the explosion and saving his life. Many fans then pointed out the similarities between Jake's situation and Adric's, with the East Space stowaway also trapped on a doomed spaceship that's about to blow him sky high. In this case though, the Fifth Doctor does nothing, instead watching on in disbelief as his companion dies. So why couldn't the Fifth Doctor have used the same trick that the Thirteenth Doctor did? Seems like a fair question at face value, but many of those riled up Adric supporters missed that the Fifth Doctor's TARDIS console was badly damaged by a Cyberman, which prevented him from flying to his friend's rescue. And still, some fans think that this is a rather flimsy excuse because the TARDIS has a mind of its own and therefore should have been able to function still. While others, hilariously, just think that the Doctor didn't like Adric and so couldn't be bothered to save him. 
I mean, it's rather cold, but maybe understandable. Now, to be honest, I don't really have much knowledge of the classic era of Who, so I don't really feel comfortable making a personal opinion on that situation. But our very own Sean Ferrick does indeed have some very strong opinions about Adric, so I would suggest checking out the video where the classic companions are ranked from best to worst, which will be linked in the description below if you want to hear his side of the story. Number 8. In the Forest of the Night Series 8's In the Forest of the Night has always been a controversial episode, but I don't think you realise just how much it split the fandom in two. In 2016, this 12th Doctor story was voted the most divisive Doctor Who episode ever in a Radio Times poll, beating out fellow 12th Doctor stories Sleep No More and Kill the Moon, as well as the 6th Doctor serial Vengeance on Varos. Now that's quite a feat, so what earned In the Forest of the Night this not so coveted title? On the positive side, this Series 8 adventure was praised for its creative premise. The people of Earth wake up to discover that the planet has been completely covered by large forests, and its lighter, more fairy tale tone, a refreshing contrast from the darker episodes of the series. Detractors labelled it aimless, threatless, and felt that there were a few too many silly moments, forcing then showrunner Stephen Moffat to jump to its defence, calling it beautifully and elegantly written. Now, it's pretty rare for the showrunners to jump in on the debate, which just goes to show how divisive this episode actually was. Maybe if there was a less plodding script and a few more standout moments, such as the deleted Doctor's speech about the untempered schism, it might have been one that was slightly more positive than polarising. Now this episode isn't particularly memorable for me personally, but I do remember Series 8 feeling quite dark in tone, and so it was quite refreshing to just have this episode of lighter tones to it. But I do think that you're always going to have that divide where there are some fans who really like the darker, more intricate episodes, and some fans who just want to watch them stand alone and forget about it after it's finished. And so you're always going to have that divide, so it's very important to find that balance in the middle, which I think this episode was aiming to try and do. Number 7. The Sasha Dewan Master Ignores Missy's Redemption Arc Though few people actually expected Missy slash the Master to be gone for good after soaking up a laser screwdriver blast in the Series 10 finale, it was nonetheless a surprise when the character returned in Series 12, Spyfall. And not because fans expected the character to be dead, but more the fact that this new incarnation of the Master seemed to be a step backwards after the arc that Missy had been on through her run in the series. While Dewan's portrayal of the character received a lot of praise from fans and critics alike, there was a subset of Whovians who were displeased and confused as to why this new master had regressed back into a moustache twirling villain after the Missy arc had shifted the Doctor's oldest foe more towards the light. Missy's decision to become a do-gooder cost her her life, so why undo such a powerful character moment for the more bog-standard villain antics we've had for the last 50-odd years? Now, credit where credit's due, Sasha Dewan has been one of the highlights of the Chibnall era, and it looks like that streak is going to continue in the Centenary special, but I can understand the confusion. Big Finish's The Lumiat has explored this gap between Missy in Series 10 and The Master in Series 12, but there are a lot of fans who don't have access to the Big Finish audio dramas, and so it probably would have been better if they'd explored this in the actual TV series so that that confusion could have been cleared up. Now, I have just done a little bit of research into the Lumiad, and the premise does sound very, very interesting, where Missy has her own version of the Valiard. So whereas the Doctor has this version of themselves that's pure evil, Missy has the Lumiad, which is pure good, which I think is extremely interesting. But like I said, if you don't have access to Big Finish, then that is going to be very confusing to the audience. Number 6. Are the Daleks overused? Now there's a Doctor Who urban legend that the Daleks are contractually obligated to appear at least once every season. Now supposedly this is due to an agreement between the Daleks' creator Terry Nation's estate and the BBC. 
Whether or not there is any shred of truth to that remains to be seen, but the Daleks do indeed rear their heads on a consistent yearly basis. Even when they don't have an episode to themselves, they can't resist a cameo, which has got fans asking the question of whether or not they're overused, and whether it would be best if they were rested for a while. On one side of the argument, the Pepper Pots have been used in some new and interesting ways over the course of their 59 year long shift, from introducing their creator Davros in 1975's Genesis of the Daleks, to Series 11's body controlling reconnaissance scout. Plus, they're the bloody Daleks, they're one of the most iconic parts of Doctor Who and have been since the very beginning. But on the other hand, it's no longer exciting or surprising when Scarrow's finest wheel onto our screens. And they've also been outstripped by other villains in terms of power and scare factor, bringing their status as the Doctor's greatest enemy into question. Personally, I don't think they're overused, maybe a little bit at the beginning during kind of series one to four slightly maybe a little bit they seem to be the big bad at the series finale pretty much every season but i also agree that they are so iconic and such a big part of doctor who that without them it just wouldn't be the same number five the sixth doctor as many polls and rankings will demonstrate, Colin Baker's Sixth Doctor is one of the least popular incarnations in the show. Digital Spy and Radio Times have both got him at the bottom of their fan voted lists, and even some of our own rankings do the same. And it's a similar story with episode polls too, with Baker's debut serial, The Twin Dilemma, being voted televised Who's worst outing not once, not twice, but three separate times by Doctor Who magazine readers. With hardcore Whovians though, it's a slightly different story. Sure, it's not like he suddenly shoots to the top of people's lists, but there's no question that love for Baker's Doctor has increased in recent times, thanks to his successful run of Big Finish audio dramas. Indeed, many will agree that The Sixth Doctor works far better on audio, which is something that our very own Tom Housen noted in 2020, stating, Big Finish enhances The Sixth Doctor. Colin's incarnation is simply a joy, and it's understandable why you'd wish to travel with him. Colin Baker even got to do an audio story that was written by the king of modern Who, Russell T Davies, which instantly upped his Doctor's cool factor. But all this is to say is that your opinion of The Sixth Doctor is widely dependent on whether or not you are an audio listener. His TV era was categorised by its brash tone, violent content and frequent behind the scenes drama, and it was this ill-fated mid-80s run that doomed him to the bottom of those fan polls likely for a good long while. However, he is much more likeable over at Big Finish, making his entire era a tale of two halves, and one of the most divisive runs a Doctor has ever had. Now again, I'm not particularly knowledgeable of the classic era of Who, so I don't have a strong opinion either way of The Sixth Doctor, but I have listened to some of the audio adventures that do include him, particularly the Diary of River Song, and I do think that he sounds very fun and exciting, so I do agree that the audio dramas have worked in his favour. Number 4. Should the Doctor become romantically entangled with their companions? No Hanky Panky in the TARDIS was basically an unwritten rule of the classic era of Doctor Who. And according to some accounts, it was actually a firm rule. But regardless as to which version of events is true, the point is, clear efforts were made to not have the Doctor be romantically involved with, well, anyone. But all that changed with the 1996 TV movie, where all of a sudden Paul McGann's eighth Doctor was snogging companion Grace Holloway. Now granted, this was more of an American take on the character, portraying him as a dashing Hollywood hero, rather than the awkward weird uncle of the main series. But even when the show returned to British waters with the 2005 revival, that romantic angle didn't go away. In fact, it actually became more prevalent, with the ninth Doctor and Rose growing closer and closer throughout their time together before capping off series one with a kiss. 
Things kicked up a gear when the snogaholic 10th Doctor entered the scene, with he and Rose pretty much becoming an item by the end of Series 2, and even declaring their love for each other, or well, almost in the Doctor's case, on the beach at Bad Wolf Bay. The modern show's decision to make the Doctor a romantic character has been criticised and appreciated in equal measure. To some, the Doctor is an asexual being, which is more or less what we got throughout the entire classic series. To others, giving the Doctor a love interest makes them more relatable and adds an interesting dynamic to their relationship with their companions. Either approach can work, which has been demonstrated throughout the decades of the show. It just entirely depends on what the showrunner at the time wants to do with their version of the character. We all know that I love River Song, and I do really love that story arc of River and the Doctor, but I do think that in terms of a romantic relationship for the Doctor, it needs to be very specific. In the case of River Song, this character is kind of 50% the point of her is to be this mysterious, ambiguous love interest of the Doctor, but she isn't a companion that is there all the time. In the case of it being, say, Rose and the Doctor, it was good because it was new. As we've said, it hadn't been done before, and so it was a new approach to the Doctor Who story. But it then became a little bit repetitive as the series went on, when you still got Martha then pining after the Doctor, and even now you've still got, you know, you have Yaz and things like that. So I think that if it's a specific character whose purpose is to be this ambiguous love interest, it works. Because I'm always going to defend River Song. But if it becomes too much of the main drive of the story, it takes away from what Doctor Who is actually about, which is about adventure and friendship more than anything else. Number three, Clara Who and Hellbent. From her shock debut in Series 7's Asylum of the Daleks, it was clear that Clara Oswald was going to be a companion the likes of which we had never seen before. Over the coming months, that certainly proved to be true, with the name of the Doctor revealing that she was born to save the Doctor, having splintered herself along his timeline to save him from various threats throughout his life. Continuing this theme of being a Doctor-like character, Series 8 even saw Clara on occasion fill in for the Time Lord, most notably in Flatline when he was unable to leave his TARDIS, and this continued emphasis on the character led to accusations that she was being overused, with detractors even coining the phrase Clara Who. Now it is somewhat understandable that these fans felt that Clara was overshadowing the Doctor, but also overshadowing the show's previous companions. At the same time though, plenty of viewers found Jenna Coleman's bubbly performance hard to dislike, and Stephen Moffat did garner some props for trying something new, actively avoiding the same old companion role we'd seen a million times before. The Clara controversy reached its peak in the Series 9 finale Hellbent, which was criticised for undoing her death in face the Raven, as well as doubling down on her desire to be like the Doctor, with the episode actually giving her a TARDIS of her own. Now I'm not personally a massive fan of Clara, I found her to be a little bit dull in comparison to previous companions. I did like her original story arc being splintered throughout the Doctor's timeline, but I think it started to take a very different turn following that. But I'm not one who likes change very much, and so I think once the notion of the companion changing slightly kind of put my nose out of joint slightly, um, and maybe that's something that I need to get over more than the show itself. Number two, should the fourth Doctor have destroyed the Daleks? There are few moments in Doctor Who history as pivotal as 1975's Genesis of the Daleks. As the name suggests, this fourth Doctor serial tells the story of the Daleks' origins, but if Tom Baker's mad-eyed Time Lord had acted differently, it could also have told the story of their end. Just touch these two strands together and the Daleks are finished. Have I the right? muses the Doctor, his hands clutching the device that could end the tin cans forever. His hesitation is understandable. After all, genocide is a pretty big thing to have on your conscience, no matter how deserving the target species may be. But at the same time, Sarah Jane also makes a valid point, reminding the Doctor that he will cause untold amounts of suffering if he lets the Daleks live. And for many years, fans have been having this same debate. Was the Doctor's decision not to destroy the Daleks his greatest mistake, or was he right to not alter the future? From the atrocities of the Time War to their regular attempts to invade Earth, there's no doubt that the Daleks have done some pretty heinous stuff, 
But, as the Doctor notes, fear of the Daleks will prompt many worlds to become allies, united against a common enemy. Maybe that's worth all the pain they cause. I think that the dilemma the Doctor faces in this episode was a really important message for audiences about morality. And also, if the Series 4 finale is anything to go by, even if you do attempt genocide in regards to the Daleks, they're going to manage to survive somehow anyway. Number 1. The Timeless Child It's tough to think of a more controversial moment in Doctor Who history than the law-shattering revelations in the Series 12 finale The Timeless Children. This episode told us that the Doctor isn't actually a Time Lord, but a mysterious being from another universe, one with the power to regenerate infinitely. The DNA from this Timeless Child gave the Time Lords their ability to regenerate, meaning that the Doctor is the Chosen One, a god, the foundation of Time Lord society. This reveal sent shockwaves through Who fandom, with many feeling that it was unnecessary, convoluted, and even disrespectful to the show's pre-established history. What was the point in Eleven's new regeneration cycle in the time of the Doctor? Do Rivers' own regeneration powers even make sense now? To some, it was even boring and inconsequential. What, the Doctor can regenerate infinitely? So? This was always going to be the way, in some way or another, for as long as the BBC wanted Doctor Who on the air. So the Time Lords lied to the Doctor about their past. And? The Doctor has never got on with the Time Lords, that's part of the reason why they ran away in the first place. While discourse on the Timeless Child skews largely negative, there are those who appreciate how it opens up opportunities to explore the Doctor's past. There's also Joe Martin's Fugitive Doctor, an important piece of the Timeless Child puzzle throughout Series 12, who received a lot of praise for her commanding presence. All in all, the Timeless Child is still one of the most debated topics in Doctor Who's various online communities to this day. Chris Chibnall certainly took a bold swing here, but considering all the controversy, perhaps Doctor Doctor Who was a question best left unanswered. Now at first, I'll be honest, I was very, very, very confused by the Timeless Child story arc. I didn't understand it, and I was one of those people that felt that it was disrespecting the previous 50 years. 60 years. But I do think that there is potential for it so long as we are given some more explanations. As long as those unanswered questions and those loose ends are tied, I think it has the potential to be a really, really interesting storyline and a really good avenue for the show to go down, so long as it's explored fully and not left ambiguous. And that concludes our list. If your opinions are different, then do let us know in the comments below, but remember to be respectful of other people's opinions. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there, at WhoCulture, and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with WhoCulture, and in the words of River Song herself, goodbye, sweeties.